out of you. Let me see. See how we're doing in here. Look at the grades. All right, there's there's still a few folks that haven't turned in the program that we just had last week on testing. The, the program itself is not that tricky because you're just writing a program that does some kind of conversion, right? Some kind of math. Uh, that's not meant to be tricky, but you're supposed to set it up in a way that you can test it with positive numbers, decimal numbers, negative numbers, zero, to where you can run the program multiple times and test it. Testing was the key to the program. So the program itself doesn't have to be that complicated. It's not a real long program. It's not, you know, like crazy complicated. It's just doing some kind of conversion, which they showed like, you know, Fahrenheit to calculus to sell Fahrenheit to Celsius in the, uh, in the sample program, but you can convert, you know, whatever you like there. A lot of people doing feet to meters and stuff like that, but there's a lot of people still missing. It looks like about half the class didn't turn it in last week. So when those zeros hit today, that's going to drop your grades down. So, all right, I need to update this. Because it's a B-Day week, so we only have class Wednesday. So if your grades are below 70, uh, then uh, just Wednesday this week. And I'm seeing about half a dozen people whose grades below 70 right now. And mainly because I, I think uh, most of those have I, I think I would dare say all of those have a missing program somewhere. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if any of those turned in the program that was due yesterday, which that zero has not even calculated into your grade yet. So you know, when that zero hits, it's going to drop your grade farther than it is right now. So it'll be there soon. It'll be there. But, soon. Uh, great right. to see everybody today. Had a good weekend. Went and saw my grandson this weekend a couple times. Actually fed him a bottle the other day. And so getting to hang out with the little man. Yesterday, he was wide awake for like an hour and a half yesterday. And so sitting there holding him and he's just looking. Of course, he can't really focus that well. Uh, little babies, it takes him a while to learn how to focus and actually see things. So he just sees this, this thing hovering over him, talking to him. And he was very interested in whatever I was saying. So it was great. I was telling him that he needs to just keep growing so he can get out of the hospital. And I said, you know, you can come hang out with Pappy and you'll have so much fun. You'll crap your pants. In fact, he got so excited just thinking about it that he actually did. So, I mean, he's really looking forward to it. So it's going to be be a fun time when the little man gets out and gets to come spend some time with us. So, well, let's go ahead and get looking. It's 720. We need to get looking at our assignment and our lesson for this week so we can get going. Uh, let's see our foundations of programming. Let's see. We're in module six. Let's go to our grade screen as usual. And we'll see. We're getting down to the bottom. I got to open up the next module because this is a very short module. We have testing, programming, coding careers, and then we'll have an exam for the first week of May. And then we'll just have just a little bit left of school. So we'll have another short uh, unit just to finish up. But uh, yeah, the testing was due yesterday. So hopefully you've got that turned in. Uh, this week is the ethics of programming good to get into and then we're going to talk about coding and careers next week so let's go to 6.02 and look at the ethics of programming lesson this week we just have a five question quiz at the end no no program to write this week so it gives you a chance if you didn't get last week's in see google's code of conduct contains the words don't be evil Hmm, but there's been a lot of debate throughout the years over what this really means and whether Google follows its own code. That's certainly up for debate. Google's official wording goes like this. Don't be evil. Googlers generally apply these words to how we serve our users, but don't be evil is much more than that. It's about providing our users unbiased, and there's a whole lot of debate on that, unbiased access to information, focusing on their needs and give them the best products and services that we can. But it's also about doing the right thing more generally, following the law, acting honorably, treating each other with respect. So Google does have this in their uh, code of conduct, but there's just tons of debate 
And you can argue that they haven't even followed that. Uh, debates have surrounded their don't be evil statement. It has actively censored certain information in the searches, especially in countries that have strict information laws. In 2013, it was accused of avoiding taxes in the UK. So not really following the laws. Uh, the question is simple, but the answer is very complex. What are the ethics of programming? So we're going to be able to describe the ethical responsibilities of computer programmers, describe various security risks and threats to computer systems, explain what enterprise software systems are, how they impact businesses, explain the importance of having a disaster or emergency response plan, and identify methods to store and backup data. So that's what we're looking at this week. Page two, ethics for the win. A programmer's job is not just writing the program code, but maintaining it, ensuring accuracy and security. Because programmers have access to lots of sensitive information. Think about all these businesses and the programs and all the customer information they have and the financial information they have. So they have an ethical responsibility to protect user privacy and data. And just because a program can be written to do something doesn't mean that it should, ethically speaking. So here's a few ethical guidelines from the Association for Computer and Machinery, the ACM, from their Code of Ethics of Professional Conduct that programmers should be following. Uh, under the Code of Ethics, it says, contribute to society in human well-being. So a programmer should develop programs that help improve society and reduce threats, making everyday activities easier. You should avoid harm to others. Programmers have a responsibility to minimize the risk of harm due to the loss of information by adhering to testing and design standards to avoid coding errors or security issues. Uh, respect the privacy of others. Programmers should create programs that maintain the privacy and integrity of user information as well as protecting it from unauthorized access. Uh, give proper credit for intellectual property. Programmers are obligated to recognize and credit any use of other people's work. Even when it's not copyrighted, protected by copyright law or patent, you still give them credit. It is unethical to take credit for someone else's work as your own. Oh, that's just true overall in any class. If you're copying someone else's work from the internet or from a friend that did it, uh, that's unethical. Access computing and communication resources only when authorized to do so. Right, Having access to information is critical in a democracy and global society. Programmers, like all citizens, should strive for equal access to information while also considering that access to information may not include the right to distribute it. Maybe just because you can access the information doesn't mean you can share it freely with others. You may have permissions to do that. So let's take a look at the following questions and consider. If you were a programmer, so this is, I'm going to open up the chat so I can let you guys weigh in on this. Would this be ethical? Ethical. Is it ethical for a company to record information about a person's interests so they can make targeted sales suggestions later? Oh, this is actually starting to be a debate in public society. Is it ethical? Um, can the company do it? like uh, right now you Facebook is being accused of doing this a lot like if you go on Google and you search for something and then you go to Facebook wow one of the first ads you're going to see is for something that you were just searching for is that ethical we're going to vote on this based on what you guys vote vote yes or no is it okay if they just get information about what you're doing online so they can target you. We got a couple of people have voted. We need some more votes to get a class consensus here. Is it ethical for a company to record information about your interests so they can make targeted sales suggestions later? If you're searching on a totally different website for a vacation in Hawaii, it's ethical for other websites to have cookies planted in your computer that grabs that information and says, 
okay, they were looking for Hawaii. So when they get to my website, I'm going to say, hey, look at this that I have that would help you go to Hawaii. All right, so our class is voting yes. I see a lot of yeses. We'll vote. Overall, 60% of people are saying no. Because if you're not on Facebook's website, what business is it, is it of them that you're on Google doing something? Should they be able to have the right to snoop on you when you're not on their website? Most people are saying no. Got to think about that. There's there's a lot of privacy issues going on right now. And oh, let's, oh there's more, more questions here. Get the final result. Oh, they'll send it later. All right. So they'll send me an email there. They'll send uh, my fakes too. So you can get the final results later after some point. All right. Is it ethical for a program to reuse somebody else's programming code to create a new program and not credit? Just say, hey, I wrote this program. Yeah, but you started with some code that somebody else wrote. Yeah, but, but I added to it, so it's my program. Yeah, everyone's pretty much in agreement. No, you got you have to say, okay, I started with this code and now I've improved it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with improving code. Just say that, yes, I started with this person's program and look, here's the changes I've made to make it better. So we're going to say no. And somehow almost 4% of people think, yeah, that's fine. Because there are a lot of people that have no ethics and have no character. You got to have some character. All right, let's look at our third question. Is it ethical for a cell phone company to create a secret backdoor for the government to access data as a matter of national security? So if a cell phone company, so if the, if the government wants to look at your phone records to see who you've been calling, what text messages you've been doing, is it ethical for your phone company to say, well, we've got this access that the government can do. We're not going to tell you about it. I'm not going to tell you about it, but you know, in, in case there's a national security issue, the government may want to look and see who you've been texting, what emails you've been getting on your phone. Is that ethical to allow that government to access that data without your knowledge, just the back door in there? Locke says no. Any other votes on this one? Got people saying no. Well, here's the thing about it. Yeah, I mean, certainly national security is important. But there are methods for the government to get that information, right? And generally, they, they, they can go to a judge and say, look, we've got enough evidence saying that this person over here we believe is involved in some activity that may jeopardize Social Security. And then a judge grants a warrant, right? They, the judge grants them the access to that. He says, yes, you can go get their phone records. This is not talking about that. They're talking about this is like somebody in the government that just says, hey, I think I want to see their phone records. And I think they may be doing something suspicious and accesses. I would say no on this. You guys are saying no, just because we do have laws that protect our privacy. And we have a method that if the government can show some evidence that someone is doing something uh, perhaps suspicious, perhaps that could be dangerous to others or our society, we have a path that they can go to and show this to a judge. If the judge agrees, oh, yeah, there's, that's that's enough to grant a suspicion. I will give you access to their information. We have a way to do that. So just allowing the government to do that whenever they want to, That that's kind of against what our country is set up for. And uh, most people say no. Yeah, that's, that's, that is not ethical. 67%. All right, last question. Is it ethical to use personal information to improve the user experience without notifying the user? So if you're using my program and I have cookies built in my program or however I do it to kind of access your computer while you're using my program to see what kind of things you like to do or what kind of things you do or uh, see if you are you a college student. So I'm going to have some stuff in there about college that's going to help you or you know, just something to improve your experience. Is it ethical to use your personal information? So I'm accessing your personal information and using that inside my program. 
to modify what the program does to make it more towards you. Okay, we've got a lot of no's on this one. I'm interested to see what the what the vote is on this one, actually. All right, we're going to say no. I'm seeing a lot of no's. We're going to vote. Overwhelmingly no. No, you can't access my personal information. You may get my financial information. You may get my medical records and all kinds of stuff. You may have stuff that you're not legally entitled to. So just write your program and don't dig into my personal information. Now, if if my program asks you some information and you and you type it in, that's a little different. But this is not really talking about that. This is talking about accessing your personal information. It's not saying about asking you for personal information. Right? I may ask you, are you in college? Hey, do you make over forty thousand dollars a year? Hey, right? or are, are, are you diabetic? You know, if I ask those things and you enter it, that's totally different. But access in it where I just search your computer to see, oh, is there anything about diabetes? And, you know, that's yeah, not good. All right. Good job, guys. Each one of these things have been debated. And some of them happen on a regular basis. Absolutely. You'll see news stories. Some of these are even legal. Notice that means some of them are not. Every time you enter your information online, ask yourself, who's keeping track of this? And why are they doing that? Let's look at this. Did you know? Programmers can distribute their programs under different licenses for people to ethically use in different ways. It's called open source software. And there are websites that have open source. And that means here's this code I wrote. I'm not copywriting it. I'm putting it out there. If, if this will help anyone, you can use it freely. Freely. You don't have to credit me. I don't have a copyright. It's just open source. And there's sites out there. And that's where I think this program can help a lot of people. And I don't want to restrict its use by making people, you know, pay me or go through copyright laws. Open source software allows users to users to users access and modify the original code. Proprietary software is owned by a company. And that has restrictions to use because they own it. Freeware is software that's available at no cost. And it could be open source or it could be proper, proprietary. It may be like, okay, here's my code. It's free. Just, just give me credit when you use it. Just give me credit when you use it. But you don't have to pay me anything. That's fine too. That's another way. So that, that's freeware. But they may say it's open source. You don't even have to credit me. So there are different ways to share programs and make sure that other people can use them. All right. Page three. Protecting yourself. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. Spam, phishing, hackers. Seems there's tons of way to get in trouble online. If everyone behaved ethically, this wouldn't be an issue. But unfortunately, not everyone can be trusted. Let's take a look at some common examples and how to catch them before they catch you. Email scams. Hello, Michelle McRae. I have an interesting business proposal I want to share with you. If, you'll be, if you will be interested, please click on this link. Email scams, privacy settings. Oh, look at this. So has credit card information are in it on there. Does the website protect your privacy? That's that's a really good question because it may very well be that they're not protecting your privacy on there. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, sharing passwords. If you have an email, oh, wait a minute. It's got stuff underneath it. Let's look at this email. If you have an email address, you've likely seen one of these. Scammers and fishers will often send emails trying to get you to respond or click on a link or provide personal information. Sometimes they'll disguise a scam by making it look like it's coming from someone you know. So if anything seems off, like lack of a subject line or irregular grammar, if you will be interested, chances are it's very fishy. And then privacy settings. Here's the scoop. It doesn't matter how meticulous you are with your privacy settings and password complexity. If you volunteer personal information via the internet, it might seem like a good idea at the time to post a picture of your new driver's license. But consider that you've just informed the entire world wide web of your name, your birth date, your home address, and your driver's license number. More than enough for an amateur hacker to steal your identity. Uh, let's see. Sharing passwords. It should go without saying, but we'll say it anyway. Don't share your passwords. Most people use the same password for multiple accounts because it's hard to remember 30 different passwords, right? So you'll reuse it. So while sharing your Instagram password might seem like 
a relationship milestone, you may not be as keen to share your bank account information. Many sites now have two-step verification because we've been forced to because of all the hackers. By sending a text or email, which is a good extra step to make sure your information is secure. Every week, I got someone trying to hack into my school Twitter account that I run for the bowling team. I have a Bentonville West bowling Twitter account. Every week, someone tries to hack that. I get information, and they do hack the password, and I get that two-step verification on my phone all the time. Was this you trying to log into Twitter? No, it wasn't. Every week. Dummy sites. That's a good one, too. Unfortunately, clicking on these online pop-ups does not make you a winner. They're usually easy to spot as fakes, but more advanced hackers will go as far as creating almost perfect duplicates of well-known sites to trick you into inputting personal information. Be on the lookout for inconsistent URLs if you're forced to navigate to an external link and look for consistent copyright tags. Yeah, I want to show you some. I want to show you an email we got here at school. I got in this at school like a week ago. I'm just going to show you this. I've added a whole bunch of stuff, but here's the original email, right? You know, right there. And it said it's PayPal. And it's a billing. This was this was one my wife received here at the school. It says the product that you had this uh, solid state drive, four terabyte solid state drive that you paid $442. We're emailing you your receipt. Here's your receipt. She's got this email. And it says, thank you for your order. If this order is placed without your authorization or have any query related to your order, you can reach us at our 24 seven hotline. Have you ever gotten a receipt that says, oh, by the way, if you didn't place this order, call us? Receipts never say that. Real receipts don't say, here's your receipt. By the way, if you didn't actually buy this, call us. Because they're trying to scam you. They want you to call this number and they're going to issue you a fake refund and they're going to issue a refund by mistake that's too big. And then they want you to send them back the difference. Oh, we were supposed to refund you $442. We actually refunded you $4,420. You need to send the other $4,000 back to us. And they fake. They'll edit your computer. They'll have you log it. They'll have you give access to your computer and they'll log your bank account to make it look like there's a deposit that's not really there and get you to send. It's crazy. But there's so many problems with this receipt. For one thing, the email says your ordered item number right there. And then it has the same number as the invoice ID. So is that the item number or is that the invoice number? Why are those the same? I looked this up. This street doesn't even exist in Greenville, North Carolina. I said, let me search the address just to see what if, because you can search it on Google streets, right? And see if it's a, a business or if it's a house. Well, that street doesn't even exist. But North Carolina and the phone number they give, this is a San Diego San Diego area code. So is your business in North Carolina or is your business in San Diego? And look, it came from Hayden Ramen 462 at Gmail. That's not a business account. And that name doesn't match the name that it says it's from. It's from Anna Riviera. Those aren't even the same. There's just a lot of things there that say, hey, this is a scam. I'm an idiot, but I'm trying to fool you into calling this number. Which, by the way, I called that number because I deal with scammers all the time. And that number wasn't even working. <laughs> so it may be one of those things that it's a fake number that it's only on when they have their computer system on. And since the computer was off, that number wasn't active. But there's tons of these scams. And I, I have tons of examples of crazy stuff that people do. So, all right. Let's look at page four. A lot of people lack ethics. Business security, just like you have to protect your personal information, businesses are also responsible for keeping their information secure. On a business level, the information is integrated with its enterprise software. Let's say that is designed for organizations, not individuals. So enterprise software is not made for personal use. It's really only useful to businesses. This is software that meets the needs of an organization rather than just individuals. That includes businesses, schools, clubs, or governments. So have you ever logged into a portal to check your grades? Yes, you have. You do it every week. Then you've used enterprise software. Hack, the home access center, is enterprise software. This type of software performs different business functions like customer information management, accounting, file storage, and more. 
So enterprise software helps organizations function more efficiently because it's specifically built for business rather than individual use. It's designed for you to be able to look all your grades and your teachers to access it and update your grades and administrators, principals, assistant principals to look at how you're doing in classes, your, your counselor, all that stuff. In the world of enterprise software, many companies end up with access to a lot of information. This can range from email addresses and phone numbers to birth dates and social security numbers. Business has a responsibility to keep that information secure or it could have catastrophic consequences. Here's an example. 11 years ago, which by the way, I have not shopped at Target since this happened because we were part of this. 70 million Target customers had their personal information stolen because they had a basic malware infection created by hackers. The data breach cost the company over $10 million in a class action lawsuit. 70 million customers had their information stolen. And so we had our credit card information taken, all that kind of stuff from Target. And we've not been back. But that is a big problem. Which, by the way, I've toured Walmart's cybersecurity division. And that's one of the biggest things they worry about. So they are constantly on the lookout for anything trying to hack into their system. All right, have a plan, use that plan. There it is, the blue screen of death. Yeah, you hate when your computer has the blue screen of death. Suddenly your life's work of music, photos, videos, documents, all those other files hang in limbo. Maybe they can be recovered or maybe your machine is kaput for good. Either way, waiting for one or the other to eventually happen is not the best plan. Think about how devastated you'd be losing all your files on your personal laptop or even all your schoolwork on your Chromebook. Now compare that to Google or IRS losing all of their programs, applications, and files. But luckily, they have a plan. It's called a disaster recovery plan. That's a document outlining procedures to recover and protect an organization's data in the event of a disaster. Every company, nay, every individual, should have some form of a disaster recovery plan. At home, I have all my computers backed up to a four terabyte portable hard drive. Every computer and every phone is backed up to that. Uh, in fact, I have 20-year-old computer stuff on there from computers I had 20 years ago. This plan is a set of processes and procedures that are put in place to guide a business or individual in the event of a disaster. There are two types of disasters. There's man-made disasters, which are like hackers, terrorist attacks, uh, dropping your phone in the toilet, you know, and there's natural disasters like an earthquake, a fire might you know, burn down your house and your computer was in there or a tornado. So explore these images below to learn more about the different parts. So let's see. Let's start with response. When a disaster recovery plan is an emergency response plan, this outlines how you or your business will respond immediately after a disaster hits and prioritize actions accordingly. A backup, having a backup of your data ensures you can restore those files, right? So you have all your information saved at a different place. Mitigation, that is the effort to reduce the impact. Let's mitigate the situation, try to make it not as bad as it is right now. In other words, be prepared with backups, checklists, and a solid plan. Redundancy, having redundant backups, that means copies in different places and services in place is not only smart, but dead useful. Redundancy reduces downtime and allows for a faster recovery phase. Like all these corporations, especially the huge corporations like Walmart, they've got all their information on all these computers in the company, but they also make backups at a whole different set of computers in a cave in Missouri, actually. But, but they have more than what they have data backup to save everything they have in their system. And it's done every day, every day they're updating all the information. So if something wiped out their building, totally burned down the headquarter, headquarters where all that was. They have all the information saved somewhere else and they could reload it all. Monitoring. By regularly monitoring your systems, you can get ahead of the risks and know the moment that anything goes wrong. Because the quicker you figure that out, the better. All right, our last page here. Back it up. Back it up. Back when Toy Story 2 was being created, this is a fun story. Toy Story 2, a single command almost derailed the entire project. In his book, Creativity Incorporated, Pixar co-founder Ed Catmull re 
recalls that someone entered this command. Apostrophe slash B-I-N slash R-M dash R dash F asterisk. Apostrophe. They entered that on the drives where the film's files were kept. That command essentially tells it to remove all files from a given location. And it did. First Woody's hat disappeared, then his boots, then he disappeared entirely. Whole sequences were deleted from the drive. Poof. All these sequences they'd built for this movie. They're sitting there watching the movie disappear. So what happened? Well, they went to restore the files from backup, only to find their backup system had failed. Toy Story 2 was gone. Crazy enough, luckily, another employee had made an entire copy of the film to use while she was working from home. She said, I'm going to take a copy of the movie home, and I'm working on it from home. And that saved the day. A backup of a backup. She had a second copy. The original got deleted. The backup failed. There was a third copy elsewhere. Saved the day. Crazy. That, that would have derailed the whole thing. So let's say this together. Back up your files. <laughs> and do it right. So having more than one backup may not be a bad thing. There's a few different types of backups, as well as different technology used to store that. There's a full backup where you, you copy everything, the entire hard drive. That's the slowest. Uh, the restore time is the slowest because you have to copy the entire thing back. But And it takes the most storage space, right? You can do an incremental backup. Only new or modified files or folders. And you can have backup systems today. Just copy anything that wasn't there before. If it's already there, don't recopy it. You've already got it. That's the fastest, takes a little bit of restore time and, and the least storage space because it's only putting files that have changed since the last time you backed up. Uh, differential backup, that's all data since the last full backup. All right, so anything that's since the last time I fully backed up the whole thing, anything that's changed since then, go ahead and do that. Takes a little bit of time, uh, pretty fast restoring it and middle of the range in the storage space. And then a mirror backup where it just mirrors any new or modified files or folders. Just make a mirror copy. That's the fastest thing to do, fastest restore, and takes a lot of storage space. All right, so whether it's human error or hur hurricane, having a plan with the right backups definitely helps. Not only does it reduce the downtime, it'll also have you up and running as soon as possible. So let's click on these images to see the most common ways. So... This is an external hard drive. That's what I said I have. In fact, I may have it with me. I don't know. No, it's at the house. Four terabytes was mine. It's a big one. This traditional backup stores your data to local media that's external. You plug it into your computer. You copy everything over to it. Uh, you could also have thumb drives or an external USB hard disk drive or tape backup devices. You probably don't have tapes. Uh, but there may be some businesses that will use a tape system. Here's another one. You could have a network attached storage, right? Backup storage option syncs your files and folders onto a storage device on your network. And only those authorizing the network be able to access it. I used to have a hard drive plugged into my Wi-Fi router and every computer connected to my Wi-Fi could save things as a backup on that hard drive. Uh, a CD optical drive, like a CD or DVD. You know, they're, they're, most computers now, they're not even making DVD drives anymore. But, you know, I have had times I put a DVD in and save information to that and just put it on a shelf in case I need it as a backup. It's ideal for storing low storage data that you'd like to share, music, movies, pictures, applications. Low cost, but they have a short lifespan with slower reads and write speeds. It takes a long time to fill one up and to download it. And then there's the cloud these days, the online backup services. You can access your data backup data via an online service. It's accessible anywhere with an internet connection. Limited storage space, often free, and then you can buy more storage most of the time. So I got to say, I've been a little hesitant to put anything important in the cloud because that means other companies have access to it. I may not want them to have access to everything I want to save. Again, you get into, do they have ethics or are they digging through my information? All right, let's look at the assignment that goes with this. It's... Uh, Five question quiz. Oh, no, this is a 10 question quiz. 10 question quiz. 
And it's all about what we just talked about, ethics, ethics, right? Doing things the right way. So 10 questions based on the lesson that we just looked at. So, all right. That's a, that's a fun topic to get into, the ethics of things, because that's so important in our society. There's so many unethical people out there. Uh, you can go and look at a lot of these YouTube pages of people that are busting scammers. All these people don't have ethics that are trying to steal your information. Uh, Pleasant Green, he's a great YouTuber I love to watch. Uh, Pleasant Green, uh, Scammer Payback, uh, Kit Boga. There's so many that's, that's so entertaining to see them trying to bust all these scammers. Uh, Pleasant Green deals with a lot of the email and website scammers because they will make a fake page for a company and you'll look up, oh, I need customer service and they will have a fake 800 number that they have paid Google to move to the top. So if you choose that first number and call that number, you may be calling a scammer because they have faked the number. So go to a company's website to get their customer service number. Don't get it off Google because there's too many unethical people that are putting fake information on Google and advertising it. So it moves to the top of the search list. So, all right, guys, that is it for the week. You've got your assignment. Uh, have a great week. If, uh, if you need to be here, see you Wednesday, but Friday's a B-day this week. <laughs>